Welcome to this episode of the E&E Show. Today we have Pastor Lucas Pinkard of First Baptist Church Lake Dallas, and we're going to talk about how to engage your community, how they engage their local community, and uh, to mobilize your people for missions and evangelism right where you live uh, and internationally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks Pastor for having Lucas, me on, man. Yeah. Th- thanks for joining me here. Uh, Lucas is a fellow nerd. Yes. And also a fellow former Fuge staffer. I, I which... am a former Fuge staffer. I personally was suspended by Joe Hicks and Dr. Tom <laughs> Rayner from working at Fuge. So, and now I'm a, a pastor. Oh, I'm sure I was very instrumental sure in my... A story in my there is, but we'll have to wait off yeah. air. So. All right. Just know, all you e e listeners, that even if you have had uh, a, a sketchy or checkered past, that the Lord can redeem you, That's and through right. grace can bring you into a, to a prominent position. No, He can just allow you to continue to work for His for uh, His glory, which has worked out. In yeah, my we're favorite we're working for His fame, anyways. That's exactly right. Make make Jesus famous where He's not known. That's it, man. And one of those places is. Uh, our own cities, our own towns. Oftentimes it right? is. Uh, more than most of us realize. So at, at International Commission, we're, our ministry focus is mostly international, hence the name. That makes sense. Right? And we work with local churches all over the world, um, helping them to share the gospel with friends and family, uh, people who they work with in their community, disciple them to be disciple makers. But the reality is that's not... Mission is not exclusive to correct uh, an overseas context. Uh, we need local churches, yeah. and so we work with local churches overseas and right here in the United States. And of course, uh, one of our emphases is also doing that, yep. working with and equipping, enabling local churches here uh, to reach their communities as well. Uh, the model that we use overseas is is personal evangelism, prayer, uh, and that's not. That works in any context, right? Right, And so uh, we want to encourage believers here in the States, especially this year where we haven't been able to go overseas, to do that same thing right here. And so there's plenty of opportunities around to, to learn your community, to serve your community, uh, and certainly to connect with lost people who are uh may have grown up here they're they're from where you live and internationals as well right so um i know that your church is uh, highly engaged uh in serving your community Mm -hmm. and so what i'd like to ask you about today is just some of the some of the ways that you do that and what advice you might have for other pastors or you know lay people uh to to do that how how do they learn where the needs are in their community, how do they meet those needs, and how do they share the gospel through it? Yeah, so we've taken what from most of the books that I've I've read about. You know, we we all want to know how do we engage our community. It's a big question that every pastor asks at some point or another. Whether you're a youth pastor, a worship pastor, um, the lead pastor, a senior pastor at a church, whatever it is that you're doing, you want to know how to engage your community. And in every one of the books I've read, there's some different tip and trick or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we decided that a lot of those things just don't work for us. We're a smaller church, so we're we're under 200 members. So that puts us in, in a category that the vast majority of churches are in. Our budget is not enormous, so how are we going to know what the needs are in our community? Where can we make uh, strategic partnerships? And that really became our focus, is who are the people that we can partner with that will know what the needs are in our community without us having to put on a big project where people come to us. You know, there are a lot of tremendous um, events and uh, and I, I guess services that churches are able to provide whenever they have a certain budget or, or a dedicated area of ministry. Um, we've got a church in our community that has a food pantry, and everybody knows that on Tuesdays they can come and get meals there if they need it. Well, we don't want to, to do something that another church is doing, not because we don't want to double the efforts in the community, but I'd rather support something that they're doing well by giving them food donations, by supporting them financially the, so that they can continue to serve our community and, and grow 
um, it, respectively where they're at, but also so that we're doing some things. And I, I think a lot of us get stuck in this habit of not being ecumenical that we we look at, well, this is our church and we have to do things here. Well, if, if another church is doing something awesome, partner with them, yeah. help them out. Like if, if we're really talking about serving our community, that means working together in order to make that happen. So we've, um, we've, you know, help them, um, collect canned goods and other things. But we knew that that wasn't going to be like our big area of focus. Is it a need in our community? Absolutely. Is it something that somebody else is doing well? Yes. Right. So why why try and and duplicate something that's already being done well in the community instead of supporting that? Yeah. So when we were looking at strategic partnerships, uh, we all want to I, I think especially those of us who have worked in the mission field, we want to recreate that feeling of doing something with purpose. Whether it is um, like what IC does with their model where you're sitting in somebody's living room and you're presenting the gospel to them, uh, or whether it's something like with World Changers where you're going out and you are sort of creating this little pocket of, you know, the, the really the kingdom on earth where you are serving people, you're meeting them where they're at, you're filling their needs physically so that you can then open a door to be able to talk to them about spiritual things. So we went to, uh, we went to the municipality. We started talking with the people that were at the city of Lake Dallas, and what we found is that the code enforcement guy was running around like crazy because we have tons of code enforcement violations in our community because we have a large portion that are uh, lower income and government funded housing. Well, these are people who are getting tickets because their yard isn't mowed, Mm -hmm. that they've got issues with their fence. And so they can't. I mean, they're they're having assistance so that they can live in those homes or in those apartments that they're in. And now they're going to be ticketed on top of that. And so we just talked with him and we said, you know, if there's something that we can do, we've got a men's group where a lot of us are very blue collar. I grew up um, in a in a diesel mechanic garage, you know, working for my granddad in the summers. And so we we talked a lot about, you know, what are what are the skill sets that we have? And we've all built stuff. Right. So what what can we do? Well, we we can build a fence. We can, you know, help somebody out that needs, you know, concrete poured. And if we don't know, we've had partnerships with other people in the community. So by building a strategic partnership with our code enforcement guys, as a matter of fact, this week, we got two emails. One that was uh, a lady who needs a fence put up um, because she's she's a new resident and to a new home. And it you know, we we met with her and she poured everything into getting this place and it's her her dream house but now she's got to finish the fence and that wasn't something that was disclosed in the, you know the uh, the financial terms whenever she got into into the house and so we met with her we met with a code enforcement guy he let us know where the the lines of um, of the property start and end and, and where the easements are and so we're going to be setting up a, a little picket fence for her in the next couple of weeks and then uh, yesterday the leader of our men's group went out and there was a mailbox that was falling over and this guy is a, an elderly guy he's retired he's applying for social security hasn't gotten it yet and he has to get the mail if he doesn't get his mail then that's his livelihood especially right now and uh, the the mailbox was leaning over they weren't going to be able the you know USPS has said we're not going to deliver mail to this anymore it's dangerous for our drivers whatever that means and then it's not up to code so uh, one of our guys went out there was able to just take it. it it took him less than 20 minutes to fix this guy's mailbox and that night he got a phone call from the guy and the guy is just in tears it's been you know he's he's an elderly gentleman obviously he's you know trying to get social security but he had he said he hadn't had anybody do anything for him since he finished in the korean war oh well the korean goodness, war happened in the uh, 50s that's yeah, like 70 yeah. years ago so it was when he was a kid was the last time he remembers somebody from outside of his family that did something kind for him and it was incredibly touching um, not just for for him, but also it allowed uh, this this leader of our men's group. His name is Jason. Jason got to talk to him, uh, had an opportunity to pray with him and to pray about some of the things that he's going through, um, to offer the arm of help, to talk to him about the church that is down the road from us that's got an incredible food pantry that he can go and take advantage of. And, and it's those kind of strategic partnerships that have really made the difference for us. And the other thing is the Internet. We don't think about it, but the internet is a is a great thing. We all have those people on our Facebook page that annoy us with their posts because no they're too way. personal. They're like, "Oh my gosh," blah blah blah. But um, like we we kind of get into the habit of of muting folks that tend to to irk us mm-hmm. or irritate us, or that we feel like overpost or overshare. Yeah, this, this is a tough season for that right now. It too. it is, and uh, and listening to some of those people, 
reaching out to him, just yeah. uh, sending him a message saying, hey, you know what? Um, saw your post, praying for you, thinking about you. Is there anything that we can do? Well, we've gotten a ton of feedback through that. Uh, most communities have a um, uh, like a garage sale site. Well, there are people that post their needs on that garage sale site. Like, hey, we, uh, we're we looking for A, B, and C. Does anybody yep. have this? Well, yep. sure, yeah, we've got it. We can help you out there. Um, on the community boards, a lot of people will, will ask for suggestions of like, where can we go? You know, for a church, we, we need to know where we can go to use some of our food stamps as a common post in our community boards. Well, as the church, now we get to jump in and say, hey, we can help you out with this. Here's some places that we can introduce you to. These are some needs that we can meet. So using social media, which for a lot of us is a very, um, to use a, a buzzword, it's a very toxic place to go. Uh, but it it can be really beneficial if you're looking for the right things and using it as a tool um, to to bring glory to God by by serving your community. Yeah, and that's a uh, that's what we're looking to to help uh, other believers with. Yeah, um, your ordinary people with normal lives. Right. Well, nobody has a normal life right now. Well, sure. But we have our daily routines. We have things that we're responsible for: our family, our jobs. Right. How can we discover those opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus? And to, to share the message of Jesus, you know, like a mission trip, right. uh, uh, for example, that's a that's that's a, a short term opportunity. We get to go and, and experience mission and do all of those sorts of things. Um, but we want to move people from oppor- just you know sh- short term opportunities to a lifestyle of mission. Yeah. And so, what is it that that inspires members at your church to to go? St- uh, actively looking for those opportunities uh, regularly. Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things, and oftentimes when we go on a, an international mission trip, we come back with, we always refer to it as that story. And uh, there's a podcast called That Story Show, which I would encourage all you guys to listen to because that's what it's about. Um, sometimes that's, it's, you know, the story that you tell at parties or whenever you get home from a mission trip or when you're around a group of friends, somebody's like, oh, tell that story about yada, yada, yada. Yeah, we, we use the phrase, you know, what's your why? Yeah. Why do you do this? Yeah, and no. so... Uh, so what is, you know, what's that story? And so when we come back from mission trips, we oftentimes we have this one specific instance, or even if you, uh, you know, you have a camp experience. Well, you know, it was Thursday night and Thursday night was cry night and that's when the Lord really moved. And so however you, you want to look at that. So Ar- when, arise uh, my love with dowel rods, <laughs> that helps a lot with cry night. It just oh, really gets man. Things flowing. Yeah, no doubt. So we, we have seen in our community when we go and we're, we're reaching out that we can just by doing what Jesus has asked us to do by going in and serving the people that are in our area, that we get those moments all the time. And, and when we have that moment with somebody that's two blocks away where we get to talk with them, well, now they're coming into the church. And one of the things that you have to be prepared for is to deal with the mess the yeah. spirituality is incredibly messy. And when people come in that, you know, you've just, you know, fixed their fence and they've got a lot of stuff going on that, uh, those aren't always the people and not to generalize, those aren't always people that are going to come in like sanctified and, and ready to be redeemed. They're people that the Holy spirit is going to have to put sometimes some incredible effort into, and that you're going to have to make yourself available to in, in odd ways. And I think that those are the experiences that our congregation is having that show them the 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 nature of God honoring that investment in bringing people drawing people to himself and that's one of the coolest things that we get is that now there's people in our congregation that have been continually investing in our community well now they have you know they're they're that story with a person that was two blocks away and then that they've watched come to Christ and have seen me baptized and now they're watching them grow in discipleship. And so this person whose house we worked on is now somebody who is with us while we're working on somebody else's house that they're getting to share that with. And just seeing the way that the Holy Spirit can grow somebody, not just at that point of salvation where we're like, oh no, we saw, you know, 27 people yeah. give their, their lives to the Lord or, you know, for Christ to have accepted 27 people into his kingdom if, if you're a, a Calvinist. So there's... Um, there's those kind of things that, that happen. And then we, when we come home, we never know what the discipleship element looks like. But when we're boots on the ground in our own community, we get to see that whole trajectory up and down. And the, the Holy Spirit just does some incredible work in people's lives and watching 
somebody whose whose life was in shambles and they never thought it was recoverable that when you watch them um you know come to christ when you see how god works in their lives when you see the fruit of the spirit start to come out in them and they they become um, good stewards they become uh, faithful disciples and then become evangelists in their own right and serving their community well there's not a story that's that's better or more motivating than just watching God do what only he can do. And I think that's been the biggest thing for, for our folks is to see, you know, lives changed because you can't measure it. Yeah. Right. You know, we can yeah. we can use the metrics of baptisms and attendance mm-hmm. and all of those things all, all that we want to. But, you know, we're we're told to disciple. We're yep. told to teach people everything that Jesus had commanded us. Well, th- there's no metric for that. But you can you can see it with your eyes, and if you're living life with people, you can notice it and be a part of it, and that is incredibly motivating to to continue on. So I don't think it's audacious to say that the that the result of discipleship should be disciples. Absolutely, right? Yeah. And so the, that shouldn't that shouldn't be a, a very foreign statement. No. But I think to a lot of us who have been uh, doing ministry, church ministry, a long time, discipleship uh, has meant. Bible studies, right? A short-term Bible study or a retreat or something like that. We know that it means more than that. Yeah. But how can discipleship become more than that? I'm bringing somebody alongside you. Yeah. I've I've noticed, especially in the young men in our youth group, that when we just engage them solely in Bible studies, that they've they've learned a lot, that they've got a lot of knowledge, but they don't have a lot of wisdom, right? So wisdom, what I've often heard, is knowledge applied. And what we're finding is that when we, for instance, when we take our men on a men's project, well, let's grab our our 13-year-olds, let's grab our 17-year-olds and say, instead of saying, no, wait for the youth trip and then you get to do mission work. No, say, okay, uh, you young guys, y'all are going to be at the bottom here. We're going to be throwing the shingles off of this roof. We need you to collect them. And it builds a, a camaraderie in between our older generations and our younger generations. And that allows us to come together and to begin to influence one another. And when that happens, you see that they start to do more together. It's not just, well, now we see each other at church. Now we're having these things. We've got guys that are coming to the basketball games of our junior high students that are showing up in masks that have no connection to them other than they work together at church and partnering together with familial discipleship. We're involving the parents in that, but also you get that other voice and then we really have the opportunity to speak you know what does the scripture say about this well how can i pray for you about these things and and especially in young men we're not seeing that there's that kind of connection across the board the way that there used to be when communities were closer together even though with our young ladies it we're we're seeing a lot of the same thing um their hearts have grown their discipleship has grown and then in that process they're also getting to share the gospel with their friends because they're having gospel conversations even though they they may not initially realize it and that's because it's a it's just a natural outgrowth of yeah. of what they're doing what they're involved in uh, so a couple of things to, to ask you about based on what you've said one would be i mean kind of a pointed question sure would you say that discipleship and evangelism go hand in hand i, I think they, if have they do to. how 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 so yeah i think they have to because i think um, i've been really really convicted about this lately I'm, I'm preaching on a sermon through um the parables and so if you if you want to hear some mediocre preaching you can listen to it <laughs> on uh, on our no, podcast that's not the case. but it's it's a lot about when we look at the teachings of Jesus, Jesus warns us over and over and over again of what happens when we don't plant the seeds and then when we don't take care of those seeds. He talks about when we, um, you know, that the, the kingdom of heaven is like a net and it gathers everything in and that all of the fish, even though there's fish of all different kinds, the, the angels are the only ones that are going to know which ones the bad ones are. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and for us as believers that the evangelism piece and the discipleship piece have to go hand in hand. And while, um, you know, not to alienate any of our, our brothers and sisters, I do believe that in the, uh, the very Baptist doctrine of, you know, once saved, always saved kind of thing, the perseverance of the saints. But when we, when we take that and examine it in light of what Jesus says, we also have to realize that there is no extent to which we have repented and believed enough. And as Paul talks about that, we always need to be like working out our salvation with fear and trembling. And so we can be assured of our salvation, which John talks about in in his epistles, but also that if that discipleship piece is not along with it, well, then what kind of foundation have we built? 
and it's it becomes incredibly um, important I think when we're talking about our high school students that we're sending off into college because if there's not a firm foundation there and it gets completely wiped out in that you know first philosophy class yeah well then they're in this place of distress where there's it, there's not like oh I've got shaky belief well now I have no belief in anything mm-hmm. my belief system has just been destroyed yeah, and you by see questions it, and you see it over and over and over yeah. again right now and so I I think that the, uh, there's, there's kind of a trend of, of deconstruction stories right. and things like that yeah and and I think one of the the best thing that we can do is to show somebody how even with a, a small amount of knowledge that you can begin to evangelize and watching the Holy Spirit work in somebody else's life is is the most motivating yeah. thing um, that there can be. And I think uh, if you've ever read uh, Greg Kokel's book, Tactics, that's one that we go through and uh, and we're actually getting ready to start just kind of a community class because we've had such success with it where, you know, students and, and adults learn to ask the questions, you know, uh, what do you mean by certain things? How did you come to that conclusion? How is this that's applicable? Good, yeah. And those kind of things where they can, even with a small knowledge base, begin to interact with people on uh, what their their Christian convictions are, even if they're brand new. And that gives them a lot of confidence that the Bible and Scripture are absolute truth, which then goes back into, now I want to evangelize and I'm continuing in discipleship. So I, I think if the two things don't go hand in hand, then we're sort of not doing it right. So another thing I want to ask you about is, is related to that. Mm-hmm. If we want to engage lostness, yeah, and we are earnest about doing that, you better be ready because we're going to find it. Yeah. So when when your church members are ministering to people in the community, even with just those practical needs, mm-hmm. and then like you said, they'll 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 be touched by that, they'll be they'll be moved by that, and especially if no one else has reached out to them. In decades, yeah. right? And you have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Uh, things can get messy. Relationships are messy. Yes. Guess what? The world, the real world is messy. And uh, it, it's kind of harder to see when we stay within our church walls. we right. got plenty of mess here, too, arguing over color of carpet or, or whatever. All oh, else, no right? doubt. Yeah. But it's or, hey, should we build a studio in here? Okay, sorry. Yeah, well, everybody <laughs> everybody was out, <laughs> so we just did personal. it anyway. Yeah. yeah. But um, uh, what advice do you have for, you know, pastors, for church members in, you know, encountering that and dealing with um, with brokenness and lostness? Um, say if it comes to, you know, uh, substance abuse or or familial problems, even, even violence or uh, legal trouble, if— if you are building relationships with people who are struggling with those things. That is um, one of the biggest questions that we had to answer. And I think it is the biggest question for every church because we we have this tendency to be cleaners of fish instead yeah. of fishers of men, right? We've all heard that. You know, Jesus said to be fishers of men, not cleaners of fish. And we, we kind of have that tendency because that's the easier thing to do. It's easier to, to go to somebody who's already come to your church because they wanted to visit and then you know they become a member and then you're like okay well you should fix this part of your life and maybe you should do this differently and you know you probably shouldn't smoke cigars and don't post pictures of of whatever and and that is a, that's an easy thing for us to do because it's they've come into our area come into right. our comfort zone and those yep. kind of things so i think the the first thing that you have to remember whenever you're engaging your community is um, just the age old adage that lost people are going to act like lost people. If somebody does not believe that scripture is absolute truth or that God is the moral authority in the world, they are going to act like scripture is not absolute truth and that God Uh, has a moral authority. And in a lot of instances, what we're finding is, especially in some of the recent movements that are happening across the country and really across Western civilization, because it's happening over in in Europe too, is that we're seeing that people are trying to replace absolute truth with man's wisdom. And when that happens, we have this incredible crossroads that we come to as a church. And, and, and when I say as a church, as a church universal. And so what we have to begin to do is realize that these people that do not believe that God has absolute authority will completely shirk everything that we do. And so we, when we come to that conclusion, step two is to we have to make a choice not to be offended. That when somebody says something that we don't like, when somebody um, believes something that we don't believe, or when somebody says something 
that is uh, in other ways offensive to us. We have to choose not to be offended. Nobody can give you offense. You have to take offense to something. So we have to, with grace, with mercy, with patience, with faithfulness, with kindness, with goodness. I mean, if you want to just go through all the fruits, we can. But using... With love. Yeah, right? So, So using the spiritual toolbox that we have which is everything that God has given us as the Holy Spirit lives within us. We get to share in those characteristics as he can pull out of even the most hard-nosed person, patience and love and kindness and compassion. We have to be willing to engage with those things. And so if we can choose not to be offended when somebody has an otherworldly view or a very worldly or secularist view, a materialist view, which we're encountering a lot, if I choose not to be offended by that, then I have the opportunity now to share the gospel with them. And if they, through the work of the Holy Spirit, come to belief, well, now we get to walk through what that looks like. And that is oftentimes the most difficult part for them, though the most difficult part for us as Christians are those initial encounters. Well, I don't know how to talk to somebody who believes this, that, or the other. I can't talk to a person who's you know, addicted to narcotics. Well, you, you can and you should and you're mm-hmm. called to. Like yeah. you're, you're commanded to you, do that. You are called to do it already. Yeah, right. So you can't, by saying you can't do that, you're saying I am making the decision to live in disobedience. That's a bad move. Is that what disciples of Jesus do? And they shouldn't. So, huh. <laughs> right. Huh. So, which is why the evangelism piece and the discipleship yeah. piece are so closely connected. Well, then the next move, you know, once they're doing that is to continue to, with that same grace and love, guide them through scripture with gentle rebukes with just the the knowledge and wisdom that the the scriptures give us and that the lord has given us through personal experiences um having relationships with other people who have come to believe knowing our testimonies and the testimonies of one another i've never struggled in particular with addiction but i also know that we've got people in our church that have and then the last thing is and i hate using this word because it's such a buzzword but it's authenticity just, yeah. just being who you are, right? I, I'm a Star Wars nerd and a musician and an athlete and was a Harley mechanic before the Lord called me into pastoral ministry. Well, as ridiculous as that resume is, God has used it in a tremendous way to impact our community. And, uh, and there are a lot of people that, that look at me or talk to me and they're like, oh man, you're a pastor? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, even me, you know, this, this goober nerd goofball, the, the Lord has used me in, in such a way that I'm able to, with my testimony and, and with my life experience, to be able to speak into the lives of other people. So I think those are the biggest things, you know, be, be willing to engage with people with a different worldview, um, make sure that you're not going to be offended, continue to engage with love and grace. And then, you know, finally, um, making sure that you're, you're doing whatever is necessary in order that, uh, that the gospel is preached and that those people are discipled well. Absolutely. Uh, from, from research that, I've been learning and looking at uh, Gen Z in particular are very open to intergenerational mentoring. Oh, yeah. And they're looking for it. So if you are a younger person wondering how you can share the gospel with young adults and students, if you are a retirement age person and you think that that they're not going to listen to you, pay attention to you, that's not true. Right. Uh, and we've got resources that can help with that. Um, IC has developed an evangelism toolkit, a storytelling with purpose evangelism toolkit. Really cool. That, yeah, so you can download it. It's free. Um, internationalcommission.org slash evangelism resources. Try to make that easy. Right. And it's a toolkit that can help walk you through how to pray for lost people. So identifying that lostness, mm-hmm. engaging it, how to begin building a relationship and begin gospel conversations with people right where they are. They may not come to your church. They may never come to your church. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are out of church right now, even if they're regular churchgoers, right? Uh, how do we meet people where they are in their lostness, in their brokenness, and begin those conversations? So there's some tools um, to do that and to help you tell the story of the gospel in an easy conversational, relational way, so you're not memorizing a script or something like that. Right. Because what we're talking about here is real life on life friendship building yeah mentorship and so i think that's a great approach to evangelism i think it's a biblical approach uh, but where to start is kind of the 
kind of the question a lot of us ask. And so that's a toolkit that can help you do that. Um, and also we have an E and E evangelism workshops. It's okay. an online interactive workshop. Uh, you can register and come and learn a, a different topic uh, every time. You don't come and just listen to a webinar, but you're gonna put it into practice. And then the idea is to give you something that you can put into play right away yeah that's so, awesome yeah talking about yeah. jesus in ways that are meaningful yeah is an incredibly important thing that we have sort of lost the ability to do in a lot of uh and a lot of just christendom we've become so familiar with our own terminology with our own system of beliefs and the way that we grew up and we've created this entire subculture that whenever we you know, encounter somebody that doesn't know who DC Talk is. We're like, what are you talking about? They're like the greatest are, band there ever. Are people like that. Yeah, you've never seen a Veggie Tale. What are you talking <laughs> about? And and so we have instead of being in the world and not of it, we've completely disengaged from the yeah. world and created this own our own subculture. And so with the very things you're talking about, like yeah, we, we don't know how to, to engage the, to that the way point anymore. To where many of us who who have been Christians, particularly who have been active in church for years and years and years, don't know how to talk to people who haven't been. Yeah, we don't know how to talk to people who've never been to a church. We right. use terms like I've been using. Yeah, <laughs> right? or, or what you know the the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross was the substitutionary right. propitiation and atonement, and people exactly. are like, I've never heard any of those words what before. What does that mean? the The reality is, one once you do that, once you what whatever evangelism methods that you know, whatever you employ, that's that's natural in the conversation, and you are you are engaging this person uh, in a conversation about. Uh, sin and who Jesus Christ is and what salvation means. So much joy comes from that, that all that awkwardness, all of the, the, the may, maybe the embarrassment or shame you feel about not having done this before will go away. Right. It all goes away because that this is what you were made to do. This is what you were saved to do. Yeah. And God is going to be there with you. One of the things I really encourage people is that uh, oftentimes we get, especially I think in uh, evangelical churches, we we get in this mindset that I have to, if I'm going to talk to somebody about the gospel, I have to present to them the entire gospel. I have to ask them whether or not they're going to pray a prayer. I have to, you know, have them close their eyes and raise their hand. Uh, But the truth is, um, if we if we look throughout scripture, that some are meant to plant the seeds, some are meant for harvesting, and and some are meant to water the seeds. And and the Holy Spirit is what creates the growth. There are some of us that are just called to be good gardeners. And it's not always about making sure that we can, you know, say some things in in such a persuasive way that the Holy Spirit works through us and we bring somebody to Christ. A a lot of times our responsibility, and because of the time that we have in a specific interaction, the subject matter or whatever, um, it's it's our job just to put a stone in somebody's shoe to where like we have said something that now they're, they're having to mull over and think about all day where now we have created this. Um, you were talking about deconstruction earlier. We've created this, this little pocket of, you know, why, why do I believe that? Why do I think that this is, is the thing to do? And by doing so, the Holy spirit will fill in that void and be able to move in a way that, that creates more opportunities um, for for different conversations, whether it's with you or with somebody else, but we have to be willing to be committed to being good gardeners, I think, and and that's something that uh, we feel pressure to like you know to get the number right. Oh, yeah, I, I led somebody to Christ today, man. You know what? T- today I I lived righteously and I did my best to engage people in gospel conversations. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, be prepared. Look for those opportunities, but. Leave it to the Lord. Yeah, you know, leave leave the results to the to Him because if you're if you are doing that, if we really believe that salvation is the Lord's job, then we're not going to take that pressure on ourselves anyway. Right. You know, we're going to believe that that He can move on hearts and save, and so we're going to want to share Jesus, and we're going to leave the result. And if we to him. if we truly trust God, but prove it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, share the gospel can and you, trust him to do you, the rest of the work. Might you make things weird? Yeah. 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 Might you lose a friend? You could. Right. You know, might you make things really weird with that neighbor for the next 20 years? Possibly. Sure. But more likely, I think that person is going to know that you care about them. They may not agree, like, they may not accept it. Right. right? But they're going to know that you are sincere in your faith and that you really do care about them. 
and and God's going to work through that. No and doubt, God's going to show His love to them through that. So so what what's a practical next step? Uh, what are you actually going to do about all this? Uh, that's what we want to help with. So we've, uh, like I mentioned before, we've got an evangelism toolkit that is going to teach you some prayer strategies, some ways to breach the conversation and share the gospel in simple conversational ways. Mm-hmm. So you're not going through a script. Uh, and then also we have some evangelism workshops that you can join, uh, online interactive workshops and learn uh, better how to share your faith uh, and actually practice it. Come and have on. something to, have something to take away. So. Uh, I know you've got some some podcasts as well that you can share yeah. that will be helpful to pastors, uh, people reaching their community. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, so I, I think the best way to to find me right now or to to look at some of the podcasts that we're doing. Uh, one of the the ministry arms of our church is a we have a podcast production studio that we allow. Um, church members and members of our community to use. Uh, But uh, right now, the FPC Lake Dallas podcast, you can look at, um, I think that's just what it's called, the FPC Lake Dallas podcast on Apple Podcasts, uh, on Spotify, and uh, and just about everywhere else uh, is a good one. And then I have, uh, and I I had mentioned that I probably wasn't going to share this one, um, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. It's uh, it's one that I do with uh, one of my best friends, and we cover just a myriad of topics, but it's it's called the Reverend and the Reprobate, which puts a bad light on him. But he's actually a great guy and, and a good who's who and a good father. Fu- yeah, exactly. Um, but he's a good father and and husband. So you can uh, you can check those out either um, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you get those, or uh, fbclakedallas dot com or revenrap.com. You can check those out. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, people follow you on uh, Twitter, yeah uh, yeah Facebook is just my name. Um, Twitter and uh, and Facebook is both Lucas uh, underscore Pinkard. And then you can you can find me and see the various stages of my my haircuts before and after my <laughs> wife yeah. decided she was going to marry me. All right. So the the evangelism resources uh, I referenced are on internationalcommission.org slash evangelism resources for that storytelling with purpose toolkit. And then the workshop is internationalcommission.org slash training. Yeah. Pretty easy. Sweet. All right. Well, join us next time for another E&E show where we will discuss and probably ramble on about things that we deal with uh, in discipleship, evangelism, and reaching our culture.